sort of a welcome back to me, welcome back to you. Uh, I've had COVID. I got COVID about two and a half weeks ago. This is the first week where uh, I haven't been on steroids and that I'm able to I'm able to talk for a few minutes at a time. Please excuse me if here and there I stop or pause. Uh, I'm still I, my I still sometimes have to catch my breath, but thankfully I'm very very grateful that I'm on the mend. That said, I just recorded a podcast that I've linked in the episode description, and in it I, I talk about a few things. So this is going to be one of those potpourri episodes. I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about Kaylee's LinkedIn page. I want to talk about Papa Rogers. And I want to talk about those messages between Steve and the TikTok creator, Brad Norton, uh, specifically about a pool party that was discussed. Now, Jules of All Trades mentioned the messages and she gave me a little bit of a shout out. She linked to me. Thank you, Jules. I'm a big fan. I follow, I subscribe. Uh, I'm going to link to her. Go follow and subscribe her. I, what I like most about her is we have very similar delivery. So I like to support women who <laughs> um, sort of, you know, where we, we present in a certain way um, and it's very much our own and we're, we have very strong voices. And sometimes people don't like that and it rubs people the wrong way. And we're both kind of like, mm, if I can get over it. So I like Jules quite a bit. That said, she's talking about the messages between Brett and Steve. Now, I know a lot of people questioned whether or not the messages were real. And one thing that I want to show you is there's a lot of reasons why I believe these messages to be authentic, mainly that he just knows way too much information. The Facebook page checked out, but he did an interview with 48 hours back in September where he says something that he had said in the messages. So I'm going to, I'm going to post and play what I'm talking about now. Involving drugs. Maybe someone had reneged on a drug payment and this was a retribution of vengeance for people not paying for drugs they had ordered. I want you guys to respond to one thing that's out there because speculation that somehow drugs were involved in this attack. That's just Hollywood nonsense. I, I just dismissed that. So as you can see, he says in the interview that the drug angle regarding the Idaho four case, it's, it's Hollywood, meaning it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a wild sort of fictional story that people are, are tossing around out there because it's dramatic. Um, he says the exact same thing in the messages to Brat earlier. Now those messages when he, when he said this mid July ish around July, end of June, the 48 hours interview happened in September. So he said it in the messages first and then in the 48 hours documentary. Now here's what's really interesting to me. I'm going to show you something. I'm sure you all remember back in was it August or so. No, it was July 9th. July 9th, JLR sends out a tweet where he tells people that the roommates were texting during the murders. I'm going to show it to you here. Now, that's interesting because July 9th is the exact date that Steve tells Brad Norton that the surviving roommates were texting during the murders. Now, is that a coincidence? Maybe. Or is it possible that JLR's source was the messages between Brad Norton and Steve G? I'm leaning toward option two. I have a feeling that JLR got that information, not from Steve, but from Brad. The other possibility, of course, is that Steve was having these conversations 
with multiple creators at the same exact time. That's totally possible. Of course, only one person's messages ended up being quoted verbatim in the airmail article written by Howard Bloom. Um, so, uh, I don't know. Could JLR have been talking to Brad? Could JLR have been talking to Steve? I don't know. But I do think that that's an interesting coincidence. Now, in Jules's episode that I've linked in the description, she talks about the pool party that Brian Koberger allegedly attended, that he was invited to by his roommate, Christian Martinez. And this pool party gets brought up in these messages between Steve and Brad. Now, in the original interviews, Christian Martinez and someone named Zach, someone named Zach Cartwright were interviewed. Zach was the DJ at the pool party and Christian was the neighbor. Nobody else was mentioned in the original interview. Now in the airmail article, say that 10 times fast, in the airmail article that I'll link below, they quote someone named Baseth Salamjohn. Now, Baseth Salamjohn is a real person. And in this airmail article, which got picked up by Inside Edition, Baseth tells Howard Bloom, that who wrote the airmail article, that he saw Koberger get up, approach two women, and get their phone numbers and, and leave. And in this article by Howard Bloom, he says that the women said that they never heard from Koberger, but they did get a series of hang up calls. Here's the problem I have with this. One, that story, it's not quoted. There's, there are no quotes to that aspect of the story about the two women getting hang up calls. So we don't know where that's coming from, number one. Number two, how would Howard Bloom have the names of the women? to call them, to talk to them, to get this information. And number three, how would Beseth, who wasn't with Koberger at the time, he was, she just, he said he gets up. He said Koberger gets up and approaches these two women. And the, a very detailed description of one of the women is given, which immediately tips me off because too many details is usually a sign of deception. How would Beseth know that Koberger was asking them for their phone numbers. Like, how does, was he privy to the conversation? How did he know? How did he know what was being said by those two? Was he right next to them? Because in the article, the airmail article, it says right after he got the phone numbers, Koberger left. So how would, how did Beseth know who the women were? How did Howard Bloom get the information to contact them? I, mean, I don't know. And the reason I bring this part of the story up is because people are using this story about how Koberger approached these two women at a pool party as an example of how he's definitely not an incel. And I'm here to tell you that incels become incels for a reason. And it's because they approach women, they talk to women, and they don't necessarily get what they want. But they also a lot of times work with these pickup artists to learn how to approach women and get phone numbers. People also like to cite the fact that Brian Koberger went to a seminar led by Margaret Atwood, the author of The Handmaiden's Tale, which is a, a story about women being oppressed in a sort of a, a, you know, a fictional society. They think that because he, he went to the seminar to talk about a book about women's oppression, he's not an incel. I really hate to break it to people, but um, a lot of times men will go to things like that. They'll go to women's spaces. They'll hang around women's spaces to meet women. They're not necessarily there or genuine about their reasons for being there. So it doesn't strike me as odd at all that Koberger would go to a seminar led by Margaret Atwood because he'd know there'd be women there. And you know, a lot of men feel perfectly entitled to being in women's spaces. And they think nothing of going to this seminar to, to pick up women. You know, they're not true allies to women. So 
I'm not surprised to hear that he went to a seminar. And it, to me, that doesn't mean he's not an incel. Now to go back to the pool party for a second. I'm just going to say it. I don't believe this story about Koberger approaching two women. I don't buy it. Uh, I think it was made up. I think it was made up because there's too much detail about, you know, with the, she's got the tattoo and the pink hair and the thong bikini. There's just too much detail. Number two, it just doesn't, I don't, the logistics don't make sense to me. How does he hear this conversation? How does he know what's going on? And finally, I want to know how would Howard Bloom be able to get in touch with these women? Now, there's no, like I said, there's no quotes in this article from these women. So how did he get this information? And the reason I question this is because um, Howard Bloom has no problem uh, making shit up. <laughs> you know, I've talked about in a previous video how he went on a podcast and said that the two roommates, when they exchanged messages, that one of them said, I think someone's being killed. And that's not what the message said at all. What the message actually said, if you go back and you read the messages, what was actually said was, I think someone killed them. We don't know when it was sent. We don't know to whom or by whom or to whom. We just know that was something that was said. So I think they're being killed and I think someone killed them. Two different contexts, two very different interpretations. So Howard Bloom, not exactly Mr. Integrity. And now there's Brett Norton. Um, I'm going to show you a text here that she exchanged with Dot. We all know who Dot is. And if you don't, just look up Dot. Dot's that witness who said that they were next door and that Koberger's innocent and she, that they saw um, a bunch of people hanging around the house. And that was, you know, exposed as fake, that they were fraud. Read the text message that I'm going to post here. Now, it's very clear Brett Norton has no problem making up a source. Now, the Seth exists. I've looked him up. Whether or not this whole bit about the women is true, I don't know. And, the, and I can't find any mention of him anywhere else other than this airmail article. And the Inside Edition picked it up. He's nowhere mentioned in the original story. So... And I know for a fact, because Brad has admitted this, she gave Howard Bloom the story about the pool party. So I'm sorry, I don't trust Brett Norton, therefore I don't trust this part of the article. Now we've heard a lot of people ask about Kaylee's LinkedIn page and how is it possible that the page was taken down within 12 hours, according to Kaylee's sister, how could that page have been taken down 12, within 12 hours after the murders? Now, I did a little digging and I talked to some people in IT and social media and uh, something that was sort of commonly said was if a certain page is getting an inordinate amount of traffic, it could slow down the server, if not crash it. So it's very possible that once the names were released, everybody was looking them up and that there was an, an insane amount of traffic to Kaylee's LinkedIn page. And because of that, the LinkedIn server was slowed. And so their IT probably looked into it. Like, what's the source of this? What's, could it have crashed? Could it have slowed? Their IT looked into it and said, wow, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on this page. And they could have either Googled the person or just said, you know what? let's just take the page down it's because the, the traffic, it's going to mess up the server. So more than likely it was a, it was sort of a tech issue and that alerted LinkedIn to Kaylee's profile. And that's why they took it down. Now for Papa Rogers. I never put a lot of stock into the Papa Rogers page because everyone said, well, he knew that the sheath had been left behind. So it, it must be the, the, the suspect. No. We knew very early on, police were saying that they were looking for a K-bar knife. And as many people pointed out, the reason they probably knew what kind of knife or believed they knew what kind of knife was used was because the sheath was found. So it, I think it was more just critical thinking um, uh, and a lucky guess. So I don't think Koberger was Papa Rogers. I've already said I think he was the author of the 4chan posts. But I cannot get past that photo on the profile because it's just too, 
It's too similar. There's, there's no way that's a coincidence. There's just no way. And something that occurred to me was, you know, remembering what Dr. Gary Bricado said and what, I, what I've always maintained is that he definitely was online talking about this, these murders. That's, that's the general belief, that he was online talking about these murders and reading about these murders. And so I wonder if the Papa Roger page was created by law enforcement or the FBI to trap him in some way, to trigger him, you know, to make him think someone's out there taking credit for his work or worse, that they knew who he was because you have to, you have to ask, like, if I'm Brian Koberger and I'm watching this and I see this photo, I'm thinking, shit, they're onto me. I'm paranoid. And, and could they have done that because they wanted to get into his head and they wanted him to mess up? The similarity in the photos and Koberger's face, just there's, there's no way it's a coincidence. So I think law enforcement might have been messing with him a bit, trying to, knowing that he was probably on these pages, you know, and the same thing, it could be for inside looking, could be for all, these all could have been law enforcement. Um, even the 4chan page, now that I'm thinking of it, the 19 minutes, they would know that it was 19 minutes door to door. Could these all have been law enforcement trying to mess with Koberger's head or trap him or get him to reach out to them or get him to comment? Something like that. Okay, so I told you about the podcast that I just put up on my Substack. It's linked in the description. In addition to the stuff I talked about here, I also talk about um, why or how Dylan, Bethany, Jack Showalter and Jack D were cleared in the time frame that they were cleared, what was looked at, what I think was looked at, and why I think they were cleared when they were. So that's in the podcast. That's linked in the description. So is Jewels of All Trade. And the airmail article. I want to know what you think. I want to know what you think about all of it, but I really want to hear your thoughts on the Papa Rogers page. So leave your thoughts in the comments. And it's good to be back.